Thank you for joining us today. We will begin momentarily. For those of you just joining us, we will begin in one minute. Welcome, my name is Piper Chapman and I'm the Assistant Director at Harvard Alumni Travels. Thank you for joining us today for our travel talk, The Snakes That Bind, Excavating a Magical Amulet in Turkey, presented by Francis Gellert Marquez. Before I turn things over to our speaker, I'd like to review the format for today's Zoom webinar. For the duration of our one hour lecture, your video and microphone will be turned off so we can direct our attention to our speaker. On the bottom of your screen, you will see several buttons to interact with. Please insert your questions in the Q&A box. You will also see a chat box, which is intended for comments, sharing information, and to engage with fellow alumni. To chat the entire audience, please select everyone when submitting your comment. For those of you who would like to hide this chat feature, you may do so by moving the chat feed to the side of your screen. Closed captioning is available and you will find it by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Should you have any technical issues, please message our support team by selecting HAA support in the chat. And as a reminder, this lecture will be recorded and shared with you. Finally, we appreciate your patience should we experience technological glitches or delays due to the nature of our virtual environment. And please be aware that you can adjust your sound preferences on your personal device. I invite you to acquaint yourselves with your fellow Zoom attendees by sharing your name and location in the chat box. And while you're doing that, I am so thrilled to pass this over to Francis Skellert Marquez. But first, a brief word about our speaker. Francis is the former Frederick Randolph Grace Curatorial Fellow at the Harvard Art Museums. There, she researches ancient Mediterranean and Near Eastern artifacts and is curating an exhibition about small terracotta and bronze objects slated to open in the spring of 2023. Born and raised in the Caribbean, she studied biology, anthropology, biology and anthropology at the University of Puerto Rico and then went on to receive her PhD in art history, visual studies, and archaeology from Cornell University. She has worked as an archaeologist for the archaeological exploration of Sardis every summer since 2003. She has also conducted archaeological fieldwork in Jordan and Italy. Frances, we are so thrilled that you are with us today, all the way from Chile, in fact. Um, so without further ado, I would love to pass the mic over to you. Thank you. It always takes a second to share the screen. Hi, everyone. I am so happy uh, to be here. Uh, thank you, first of all, to Piper and to everyone at the Harvard Alumni Travel Offices for uh, inviting me to be part of this lecture series. And also thanks to all of you, our audience joining us uh, today from far wide uh, and here willingly, I hope, <laughs> 
to listen about a fascinating and complex, at least complex for me, topic uh, that might perhaps um, unexpectedly lead you to consider some contemporary social issues in a fuller light. Uh, I am coming to you from Santiago, Chile, where it is already the afternoon and uh, very, very warm and the sun is coming towards me. So hopefully I won't have to move back. The other thing that might happen, and I apologize now, is I did lock my cat out of the room, uh, but she might come screaming because her name is Serpentina and she might hear a very similar word uh, to her name. So if that happens, apologies. So first things first, I always like to begin um, by parsing my title mostly so that we are on the same page uh, and so that you have a general idea of what to expect from the talk, but also because it helps me keep myself in check. And I can already tell you that I regret the use of one word, at least in this title. Okay, so let's go for the title. Um, very well, um, snakes. According to Wikipedia, snakes are elongated, limbless, carnivorous reptiles of the sword order Serpentis. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, will the snakes that we discussed today conform to that description? Partially. Uh, that's why we've identified them as snakes. Uh, but as you will hopefully see, they might also have some unexpected um, attributes. Do snakes bind? Um, sure. Uh, you may imagine a snake coiling around its victim in order to asphyxiate it. Um, you may also imagine a snake that's coiling around itself, biting its own tail, uh, and making a circle around something in order to either frame it or to protect it or to consume it. Uh, that's actually called an Ouroboros. It's actually a very common artistic device that I've seen in a lot of jewelry recently. So you, I'm sure you've seen uh, the snake biting its tail. Um, and lastly, you may think of the idea of binding in the realm of spells, where the word is used broadly to describe the effects of certain gestures or chants or even objects that try to either constrain or to incite a certain activity in a rival slash enemy, or perhaps even in an erotic interest. So binding is to control or to inspire actions in people that we like or in people that we don't like or in things that are acting against us. So, that's what uh, binding is. Okay, excavating. Excavation is the work that we do in the field as archeologists. Magic is a conceptual mess uh, and a relative term. Uh, we call something magic only if we do not, or if we no longer accept the premises that gave it meaning and allowed it to work. And this is the word that perhaps I regret using. Uh, and the term reveals more about me and that it does about the objects that I will show you or about the people who made them and use them. Um, those objects are usually categorized as amulets. Uh, what are those? <laughs> the word amulet comes from the Latin word amuletum, uh, which Pliny defines in his natural history as an object that protects a person um, from trouble, or in any case, from danger. Uh, and really anything can function as an amulet. I'm sure you have some at home, uh, I am wearing one right now. It's very small, but maybe you can see it. Uh, but I can tell you what it is. It's an evil eye bead from Turkey. And so it's so, supposed to protect me from the evil eye. Uh, and then we get to Turkey, right? Uh, and hopefully you all know Turkey, at least broadly. I, however, will be discussing a very specific place called Sardis. And here we have it on the map. I put a little heart uh, over <laughs> where it is. Uh, so that I could find it. Uh, to this day, perched in a highly strategic location in Western Anatolia. And because of its privileged position, it is a site with a very long history of occupation from Lydians to Hellenistic Greeks, to Romans, to Ottoman Turks and beyond. And I do want to tell you a little bit about it before we get uh, to the amulets. I started working at Sardis as a young graduate student and in the 18, 19 years uh, that I have been there, I have fulfilled many roles. I have excavated, I have worked as the site register, uh, and I sometimes have just provided um, grunt labor. I have also devoted many years um, to the study of the site's terracotta figurines. Today, however, I, you will be hearing about my role as an excavator. And unfortunately, you'll be hearing a lot about excavation, perhaps more than you want. 
the current excavations were first directed by George Hoffman, who is a professor of archaeology at Harvard University, um, as well as a curator in what used to be the Fogg Art Museum. Our permanent research and publication center is still located in Cambridge at what are now the Harvard Art Museums and where I recently completed a curatorial fellowship. So these two parts of my life, both field art museum, are greatly intertwined. I want to make clear though that the objects excavated by us at Sardis remain in Turkey and are not actually part of Harvard's collection. So if I show you something that we excavated in Turkey, it is still in Turkey. And if I showed you something that is in the collection of Harvard, that did not come from Sardis may have come from somewhere else, but not uh, from us. I should also add that the excavation of Sardis is conducted with the permission and support of the Ministry of Culture and Tourism of the Republic of Turkey. The expedition is one of the longest ongoing international projects at Harvard and has created remarkable, a remarkable legacy of collaboration and mutual engagement between Turkish scholars, students, uh, members of the professional, government and local communities, and those of us at Harvard and other international institutions. And it is because of the support of all of these people, and they're very, very generous in their support and their participation, uh, that we have been able to continue excavating pretty much without stopping since 1958. Uh, we were even able to conduct research uh, during the pandemic, and that's thanks to our, our Turkish colleagues, as you may imagine, in a much more uh, reduced fashion. As I said, uh, Sardis is located in a famously strategic position in Western Anatolia. And because of that, it has had a very long history of occupation. The site, however, is most famous for having been the capital of the Lydian Empire, which reached its greatest extent um, during the seventh century BC. So Sardis is here, uh, but you can see how much uh, the Lydian um, Empire had uh, an effect over. It is also, and this is just to plug the site as a place that you might want to visit one day, uh, it is also the location of the fourth largest Ionic temple in the world, and in my opinion, the most beautiful Ionic temple in the world. Uh, what we now believe to be uh, the largest Roman triumphal arch in the world. Unfortunately, it was destroyed in an earthquake, so this is all that remains this mess here, but still exciting and worth a visit. Um, let's see. And it is famous because at least in the realm of myth, in the realm of myth, sorry, it is the place where King Midas uh, of Phrygia uh, rid himself of the golden curse. And this is a wonderful print uh, that you can go see at the Harvard Art Museums that shows part of the myth. Um, of King Midas, and hopefully you will know it, but I'll say it very briefly. So Midas was very nice. He helped this one guy one time turn out that the man he helped was associated with the god Dionysus. Dionysus decided to repay him back his kindness and offered him whatever he wanted. And he said that he wanted um, that everything that he touched turned to gold. And that was probably fun, I'm sure, for like a minute. Uh, until he realized that he couldn't eat uh, or drink water. Uh, so he went back to Dionysus to ask for uh, this gift that he had asked to take it back. And Dionysus said that, yes, he, you know, he's not a bad god. Just go to the river Pactolus, which is at Sardis, wash yourself there, and you will be rid of the curse. Um, so actually here you see, this is King Midas uh, talking with Dionysus, and you see him again here in the back, uh, washing himself uh, in the river Pactolus. And this, what the Pactolus looks like if it's been a really rainy winter, not usually, uh, but this is the river Pactolus now. Um, and ever since then, or you wouldn't be surprised to know that this river used to run, at least uh, anecdotally, um, you know, heavy with gold at one point, uh, which made for the wealth and the fame um, of the Lydian kings of Sardis. Uh, in fact, there is a very old uh, saying uh, that every time I say it in a college class, no one knows what it is, but as rich as Croesus, so hopefully some of you remember that phrase. Um, Croesus, the king of Lydia, of course very rich because that river was always full of gold. And also perhaps not surprisingly, the Lydians were the first people to mint coins, uh, at least in the Western world. Um, so they're very famous for their coinage because they had access to all of this uh, material wealth in the form of metals. Uh, and here's one of the famous coins from Sardis. Um, this is not gonna come later. I'm not gonna test you on anything, 
But do notice that it's, it has a lion and that the lion has this like little brown thing here. It's like almost like a little hairy wart. But I've been thinking a lot about these little rays coming out of this sphere. Maybe it's the sun or something, but just look at the way that rays perhaps or hairs are represented uh, even in this point. Okay, let's see. Sardis is also home to one of the most beautiful and dramatic landscapes in the Aegean region. And you should all visit, and I hope that you do one day. I'll be happy to give you a tour. Now, the shape of that beautiful landscape is not natural, uh, but the result of millennia of human intervention. Over many, many centuries, the people of Sardis transformed the natural steep land to create broad, flat terraces with sharp edges and regular outlines. At first, we thought that this process had been started by the historical Lydians, to the times perhaps in the 8th century um, BCE, but we have recently learned that this process began as early as 4,000 years ago uh, in the early Bronze Age. And this is not a slide from Sardis. I just brought it to show you the basics uh, of terrace construction. So if you have your landscape, which can be whatever shape that's not convenient, uh, and then you encase the area that you want to terrace uh, with some walls, Right? You put some walls and then you fill that out uh, with dirt or debris or whatever, and then you can create a nice uh, flat terrace where you can build. So it's a very um, useful, smart way to control um, and change the um, landscape. So in telling you the story of our amulet, and I do promise that I will get to the amulet at one point, I first need to tell you the story of one such artificial terrace located roughly at the center of ancient Sardis. Uh, and this purple line here and that you see uh, indicates the Lydian fortification wall. And the terrace is right smack in the middle. I have been excavating in this terrace on and off since 2004. Um, I should note though that archeology span can be as much about luck as it can be about experience. And I am perhaps the unluckiest archeologist on the face of the planet. Any trench that I open is pretty much guaranteed to be empty. So the story that I'm about to present is not so much my story, but that of those who were digging next to me, behind me, on the day that I was homesick, two days before I arrived on the site, whatever. So I'm always there and always around, but I'm never the person finding uh, any of these things. But, so this is deeply indebted to all of my colleagues at Sardis. Our story begins in the early 80s uh, when we discovered the corner of a temple. We called it the Wadi B Temple because of its location in a place that we called the Wadi B. And archaeologists are renowned for not having very creative names for things. Uh, and we concluded that this temple dated to the first century CE and that it was dedicated to the Roman imperial cult. And that's it. Uh, digging up a whole temple can be a massive enterprise, so we left it at that. Uh, we knew the temple's general date, uh, but we only had one corner, uh, so we couldn't even be sure of its proper orientation. We assumed that it faced east because that's what most Greco-Roman temples do. We returned to explore the area in 2001, when after conducting a geophysical survey, we felt better equipped to investigate the, the temple's larger urban context. We then discovered that the temple actually faced north, and that it did not stand on its own, but that it was part of a great sanctuary terrace uh, in the center of the city. So, uh, you know, there would have been a temple facing a big, beautifully, you know, paved area uh, with big walls uh, at the borders, and then probably a nice um, portico uh, with columns. So, it would have had these shaded areas with columns. Um, I open a trench in this area here where we confirmed uh, the presence of a monumental staircase aligned with the temple. Other than that, the most exciting find in my trench was a watermelon that my workmen buried for me to find on my birthday. Um, my colleagues elsewhere on the terrace platform, as you shall see, were far luckier. Now, having confirmed that central access uh, for the um, sanctuary, we wanted to confirm how far it expanded to the sides. So we really just wanted to find this wall here. And we did some calculations so we had an idea of where it was. Uh, so we did as one does. So we decided we would try and explore this area. So we did as one does and we set up a long uh, rectangular trench perpendicularly across the spot where we wanted, where we were expecting the wall to be. 
uh, so that we would hit it, even if our calculations were off. So we made a long skinny trench, hoping to find a wall. Uh, and we were exactly right. Uh, the eastern wall of the terrace was where we had calculated. However, as it often happens in archaeology, we went looking for a wall, but we found all sorts of things that we weren't expecting. Uh, so we found surprises on either side of this wall. First, the entire area showed evidence of a massive catastrophic event. Um, we're pretty sure a big, big earthquake um, that happened sometime in the seventh century CE and for which there is no historical documentation. And, but the destruction looked kind of different on either side of the wall. And again, just as a reminder, since we're dealing with a terrace wall here, so again, imagine a terrace wall, kind of like this one, on one side, one side you'll have the terrace platform proper, and on the other side, you'll have something else, but you'll definitely have like an upstairs and then downstairs situation. Okay, so upstairs we found this, and you can see it here, chunky, rubbly mess. Um, and then downstairs, uh, we found a mess that was made up of more monumental architectural blocks. Uh, and this is how it looked like in the original small trench. And this is what that mess looked like in a later expansion. Again, this is not me. This is my wonderful colleague, Lauren de Um, So what is going on here? This is huge, right? So it turns out that the temple had been dismantled and its fragments, inscriptions, and sculptures reused in late Roman constructions just below the terrace. And that that earthquake that destroyed everything was so massive that it managed to topple those buildings over. So really what you're seeing here are the remains of the temple. They were just used to reconstruct something else. Now, the practice of repurposing building stone for new construction or of reusing decorative sculpture to adorn new buildings was widespread in late antiquity. And you might be familiar with it from famous monuments like the Arch of Constantine in Rome. So the dismantling of an early Roman temple at Sardis and its reuse in late Roman construction is not at all weird or odd. Now, it took about four years, I think, and many, many strong people and a bunch of old machinery, uh, but we eventually were able to clear the debris and we uncovered the remains of a great wall built out entirely out of these temple materials. Uh, a road, the remains of the gate. So this is a new massive gating project uh, around late Roman Sardis, uh, perhaps in the fifth or sixth century CE. Uh, the earthquake that toppled all of this over also destroyed a small tavern built under the fortification's shadow seen here. And again, this is uh, my colleague, Lauren. Uh, I did not excavate this, obviously, so you can clearly see some of the many, many finds which included marble tables, bronze vessels, hundreds and hundreds of coins, and at least um, two sadly uh, and brutally um, exploded patrons, uh, probably uh, through fires uh, um, after the earthquake or during the earthquake. So that's downstairs. Uh, the picture upstairs on the terrace platform proper uh, was widely different. Here we found the remains of a charming late Roman house. Uh, even within the narrow scope of the test trench, uh, we had said it was evident that we were dealing with painted walls, tiled floors, and a lavish domestic assemblage. So this is when we first opened, you can see it's very narrow, and immediately you can see the tile floors uh, coming up. Uh, so a very nice domestic assemblage, including at least four swords, you can see one, two, a few of them there, uh, and multiple glass vessels. Uh, and this is when I was digging up watermelons. So now after about eight seasons of excavation and significant expansions to the north and the west, we have been able to identify 11 distinct spaces in what appears to have been a very large multi-room structure. Uh, and the facing here is long and complicated with over 200 years uh, of structural changes and history and mostly uninterrupted um, occupation. And again, this might seem like it has nothing to do with anything, we are going all the way up here in order to get to our amulets, but I'm hoping to paint a very rich picture because I'm still trying to figure out what these objects mean. And it's so rare to get them in context that the better we understand the context, the better that we can come up with um, some interpretations for them. Uh, so let's see, I, let me very briefly give you an idea of the history of this structure. 
So as far as we know, first in the fourth century CE or thereabouts, uh, a large building took advantage of the footprint, the architectural footprint that was left over by the sanctuary. So this was the terrace wall, and this was probably the foundations for the colonnade. Uh, so the building incorporated these into its own structure. Um, then likely in the fifth century, so about a hundred years later, maybe the space was restructured, separate rooms started to appear and you can see one, two, three, four, five, all these rooms. And then eventually perhaps they separated into clusters. And we're not entirely sure when this happened. If it happened, we're not really sure yet what the relationship between these two areas are. And that's something that we're still trying uh, to work out. But as far as we can tell, this was a time of very great prosperity. Uh, modifications uh, to the house seem to have coincided with the construction of that big gate here. So this is the house, um, this is the big gate. Uh, and with the occupation of the small taverna um, that I showed you before. So all of this is happening at the same time and it's, I'm sure, very exciting. Now, two centuries later, uh, the, pretty much the entire area is destroyed, we think, um, after an earthquake. Um, and you can see, again, this is my colleague Lauren with the earthquake debris on the you know, downstairs portion. And this is me with earthquake debris on the upstairs section. So the entire area was destroyed. Um, it appears that the areas closest to the main wall uh, were beyond rescue. The same perhaps was not true further west into the terrace where we have evidence of an active and varied response uh, to the earthquake from the minimal stabilization of you know, standing structures to repair of soluble areas, to more ambitious construction. Um, and perhaps mostly what we have is really rescue and stockpiling of materials. So we do have people coming back either to rebuild, to restructure, or just to take materials and rebuild elsewhere. But people don't just leave. Uh, finally, we think that a second massive uh, destructive event, perhaps a second earthquake, just destroys everything. Uh, and that's almost it, that's not the end. People still come around, people still try and salvage, people are still living in the area, uh, but this is the big, big end to most, uh, you know, habitation or serious habitation of at least this area uh, of the city. Okay, so now, before we get here, I do very briefly wanna show you some parts of the structure just because they're really cool. Uh, and I think that you will enjoy them. So I wanna start, uh, in this area here, which is probably the one that we know the best. Um, and it's for sure we think connected uh, or a, a cohesive unit within itself. I'll start with this room here. Room one is the first one we discovered. Um, I did not excavate this room, which is approximately um, six square meters in size. And it was filled with a variety of objects and debris from a collapsed um, upper story, um, including, uh, very fine metal objects. Uh, you can see some of them here. These are folding stools, very similar to the ones that we still use. Um, these probably fell from a second floor, or they were probably here, but also we have debris from a second floor structure. We also found the, the swords that I showed you before. Um, the room's walls were decorated with an extravagant faux marble architectural landscape. Sorry that this is pixelated. Uh, and to this trade, they remain very bright and vivid. Um, and they're a joy to behold, um, but not so much as the floor. The tile floor in this space is fantastic. Um, it's even, it's very stable. And in some cases, some of the tiles are decorated with chickens. Uh, chickens or ducks, I'm not sure. And you can see one of them here. Uh, sometimes too, they prefer, the, they preserve the paws of puppies. Uh, in one case, I found one that had a goat. Here you can see the chickens. These were drawn uh, by finger um, before the tiles uh, were fired. Okay, so that room was a joy and a treasure trove. And because it was so uh, you know, full of charming elements, uh, we had high hopes for the same would be true for this room uh, right next to it. And of course it was my duty to excavate this room. And of course it was um, empty um, to my great, great, great disappointment for the most part empty. Uh, the entire floor here, there was nothing on it. In fact, part of the floor was missing. 
uh, the part of the floor that was there didn't have any chickens or so it was all very sad. The walls though were painted uh, with a really fun uh, scheme of um, curtains. So these are a replication of curtains with embroidered flowers, red flowers and red blooms. Um, so that was, you know, wasn't all bad. Uh, then against the wall, room's Western wall, we discovered a mostly incomplete but still exciting marble table. Um, again, another example of reuse, the food and the base of the table do not seem to have belonged together originally, but to have been recarved and retrofitted in order to live a second life. And then just south of the table, we found an interesting cache of objects which appear to have fallen from the wall uh, or from the table itself, which included a glass jar, a small vocal column, a spearhead, a hoe, a long sword, bring your long sword total up to five. And I say all of this because I think it is important to note that the objects in this house already start giving us an idea of who might have lived here. I mean, who might have had five long swords, for instance. Uh, so do think about that. I'll just very briefly walk you through the rest of the house. There's an open courtyard here uh, in which we find a lot of materials that would be stockpiled, perhaps either for reconstruction or for redecoration, we're not sure, or to be moved away. Um, the house also had its own personal latrine, uh, very nice, again, made out of reuse materials from the temple itself. It's kind of hard to see how it would work. There would have been a seat over this area here, which is now missing, and then water would have come from this pipe and flushed and the waste away. Um, also, this is significant that they had this latrine. Because there was a big hole, I was actually able to get really deep in there and take samples. Um, samples. Uh, and we did parasitological studies and discovered that the people that lived in the house were actually fairly healthy, um, probably because they had their own toilet. So something to think about. Then this room here, which is more humble and we think was a kitchen. Uh, it was full of objects. Of course, I didn't excavate it. Uh, but just to show you again that this was a house with different rooms with different um, uses. Um, this is some of the objects that we found inside the so-called kitchen, including a lamp. Uh, with um, glass bulbs. Okay, so the, we're getting there. Uh, so this is the area that concerns us. We decided to continue exploring this wall over here. Um, so we opened two trenches on either side of the wall to see what was going on. Uh, we discovered that the wall had just collapsed uh, entirely onto one side. You can see it here, one, two, three arches, perhaps from windows from that wall. And then that the other side was empty. So as you can imagine, my colleague was digging this side and I was digging this side. Uh, and again, here, just to show you and plan this collapse, beautifully collapsed wall onto one side and perhaps emptiness on the other. So I'm used to um, not finding anything. In this case, I was disappointed in that I did find something eventually. So eventually I did come down onto a floor and it was a marble floor. It was weirdly enough lacking any sort of object. So you know, probably an area that had already been emptied out or was in the process of being emptied out when it was finally destroyed. And you can see me very sadly brushing this empty floor in this picture. Um, and do notice that, well, even though I am sitting on marble here, these spaces are just empty. So some of the stones uh, have already uh, been lifted. Now, we eventually expanded and now I can say that the area is actually much, much richer than what it appeared at the time. This is actually a very, very grand um, courtyard. It's about 40 feet wide, if I'm not mistaken. We have three of its walls. We still haven't found the extension of it to this side. So we still don't know exactly how big it is. And it's pretty exciting. It has beautifully painted walls, again, a very similar style to that first room with very, um, you know, colorful, you know, fake marbles. Uh, and here you can see some of the wall paintings that we uh, uncovered this summer in the process of being cleaned. So that was very exciting. We also discovered, again, more materials that were being reused from the temple and from the sanctuary. Uh, in this case, these big inscriptions were being used here to form a basin, so an area for the collection of water. We have beautiful um, draining system, drainage systems, including this um, gorgeous rosette uh, drain. So it, it's a space that was grand that included water features. Um, and 
you know, that I'm not, enti we're not entirely sure what it was used for or exactly uh, how it was arranged yet. It also included, we discovered this summer, some stones that were um, engraved with these uh, beautiful things called, uh, that scholars called game boards, uh, which could have been used to play games or could have been used to mark special uh, places that had either religious or magical significance. Uh, so the space is turning out to be much more interesting uh, than perhaps it had originally um, led on. Now, the one part that I want to, you know, point out about the space is perhaps you've noticed there's this big mess in the center, and this is exactly how we left the space at the end of the summer. So we haven't excavated this area. Uh, so there's a lot more learning that we're going to have to do, but I do want to explain to you a little bit about what's going on here. Um, again, we're not entirely sure, but what it seems like is that we have a row of columns that was supporting a row of arches. Um, and you can see me cleaning here some of the tiles from the arches. You can see this is a column over here, and there's another column over here. Um, the columns themselves were eclectic, again, reused. The tops were different. Here I am cleaning a Corinthian top for a column, a Corinthian capital. And you can see behind me, there's a different one, an ionic one. Uh, so this perhaps what the space would have looked like. This is a reconstruction at Ephesus, which is a site nearby Sardis. Uh, it's one of their late Roman houses in the terraces. And you can see that they have these row of columns with these arches on top and that the columns are different heights and have different little capitals. So we think it would have been a very similar space. Okay, so we're there. So we're right here in this collapsed colony. And there, next to one of the columns, as I was clearing the debris, found this thing. Very exciting. You can see a gleaming white in the dirt. And I'm sorry that this picture is so terrible, but this is the kind of picture that sometimes you take in the heat of the moment when you find something. And I was just trying to kind of record where it was found in relationship to uh, the things that we were uncovering. And I threw in a ruler just for scale because I had nothing else. And here you have it again, that gleaming thing. So yes, ah, a moment of glory for me. Finally, I have something fabulous to find. Okay, so don't get too excited for me. Uh, I won't lie to you. We actually found two. Uh, one of them was really well preserved and the other one wasn't. The one I found was the really, the one that was really bad preserved. The other one was found by my colleague, um, Hakan, who was excavating in my trench uh, before I arrived at the site this year. Um, because I was late coming in because of uh, travel restrictions because of COVID. So actually, this is, isn't even my find. Uh, but let's look at the amulet finally. And probably the best way to understand these objects is by looking at drawings of them. And I am deeply indebted to our fabulous drafts person, Kathy Alexander, uh, who made these fabulous drawings. And if you've ever wondered why we always have a photographer and a drafts person in excavations, it's because of this. Because Photos can give you certain amounts of information, but drawings give you a whole lot more, or at least different information. So let's see what's going on uh, with this amulet. Just a very brief description of it, and you can go along with me. So first of all, whatever this was, it was made out of lead. So that's one thing. It's very heavy, uh, and it feels very odd in the hand. The other thing that we can note is that it's a pendant, right? So you can see that it has this little, let me see if you can see it better on the other side has this little loop. So it's meant to be worn in a chain probably around the neck. It's not that big. You saw it in my hands. So it's about 4.5 centimeters in diameter. If you take the entire height, it's just over five centimeters. Again, not that big, but heavy. Uh, and something that would have been very noticeable, much more noticeable than the amulet uh, that I'm wearing right now, for sure. It is decorated on those signs and it's inscribed on those signs. So one side has this, it's hard to see, but trust me, it has a circle. Inside the circle, it has a face. You can see it here in Kathy's drawing. The face has a big open mouth. And it also appears to have a beard. So these wispy things, kind of like the hairs on top of that lying on that coin. Then around it, there is a cross. And in each of the quadrants of the cross, we have two snakes facing each other. Now, these are not normal snakes, I would say. Hopefully, you can see that they also have these six little hairs each. So either something radiating 
So like a crown or solar rays or hair, uh, that's part of the snakes. Now, the other side is a little bit more complicated. It has a motif known as the holy writer motif. So it has a saint, we don't know whom because it's not, uh, it doesn't tell us, but a saint, uh, he has a little halo around his head riding a horse. There's a little star above him. Uh, he is standing or he's riding right next to an angel. The angel is standing beside him with his wings down. Uh, and he has a big spear. And at the end of the spear, there is something. There is a figure that uh, the saint is stabbing. Most often, this figure is identified as a female demon. But really, there's nothing there to identify it as such. It's just a prostate figure uh, with some hair, perhaps. Um, but that's it. The inscription around uh, the edges turns out to be um, Psalm 90 or 91, depending on the version of the Bible that you're reading. Um, and the English version, what is it called? The, the King's James version of the Bible is 91. And it starts with, he that dwelleth in the secret place um, of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Um, so this is generally, um, a psalm of protection, um, and it's commonly invoked in times of hardship. And interestingly, I just found out it's known as a soldier's psalm or the soldier's prayer. Uh, and uh, apparently, uh, you know, the U.S. military gets it sometimes printed in bandanas. And here you have um, these uh, people receiving the bandanas with the psalm and this young soldier wearing it across his head. So it's a long, long traditional or you know, long, it's been a longly or traditionally protective for a very, very long time, I should say. So that's what our amulet has. Again, a head surrounded by snakes on the one side, the rider, the angel, and the defeated person or thing at the bottom, and then this protective inscription uh, on the other. So turns out that these amulets are part of a relatively well-known type of Byzantine amulets uh, that address the uterus, that appear to address the uterus. Um, they're usually known as hystera amulets. Uh, hystera means uterus in Greek. Um, and they're known as hystera amulets because they usually include uh, what we call the hystera formula, so a charm um, that addresses the uterus. Um, and it's not always the same formula, but it, it's similar. It, usually starts with uterus, black, blackening, and then from there it goes. So you can just have that hysteria, so uterus, or you can have uterus, black, blackening, or you can have more information, uterus, black, blackening, um, slither like a snake, roar like a lion, lie down like a lamb. So compared to very violent animals and then told to calm down. So that's the injection there against the uterus. Um, sometimes too, it has other instructions for the uterus, uterus, black blackening, drink blood, uh, eat blood. Um, so kind of generic, uh, it does repeat. So the hysteria amulets tend to have that formula. And then most of them also have what we call now the hysteria motif, uh, which is a face surrounded by snakes. Okay. so. In order to be considered part of this group, just by association, you don't have to have both. Sometimes you do. In some cases, you just have the hysteria formula um, associated with a completely different type of motif. In some cases, you have the motif and not the hysteria formula. Uh, so that's the case with ours, where we have perhaps the hysteria or uterus motif, the face uh, with the snake, uh, but not with the formula. In this case, as I said, we have Psalm 91. Uh, and then also the writer motif on the back. And there's an example from Harvard that again, you can go see at the museum if you want. Um, the museum at Harvard is fantastic. If you ask to see objects that are in their collection uh, with enough time, they will allow you to actually see the objects in person. Uh, so this is a very similar amulet to the one that we found at Sardis. Uh, as you can see on one side, it has that hysteria or uterus motif, so a face surrounded by snakes. Uh, but on the other, it doesn't have either the formula or it doesn't have the writing uh, saint. It just has Saint Teofano, uh, who is a female saint. Um, 
not associated necessarily with childbirth. Her miracles don't have anything to do with childbirth, but she herself was born miraculously. So perhaps there is an association there uh, with uh, the health of women. So, you know, let's be clear in the Byzantine periods, the rates of both maternal and infant mortality were very high. Uh, deaths of women during pregnancy and childbirth and deaths of children were often attributed uh, to child killing demons uh, that were female themselves, probably because they were envious because they themselves uh, were childless. Um, so, you know, that this is meant to protect women is probably true and probably easily identified just by the, the calling of the uterus, uh, by this motif of the holy rider defeating a female demon. Um, but I would say, or I would like to propose in a sense, uh, that these amulets were perhaps more multivalent that we give them credit for, and that they could have been used for all sorts of purposes. Um, yes, certainly for women, uh, yes, certainly for protecting women who are about to give birth, uh, or just in general, because, you know, having a uterus can be very <laughs> problematic. Uh, you know, it bleeds, it doesn't bleed, it, it hurts, it doesn't hurt, it grows, it gets tiny, you know, it's, it's, it can be uh, an issue. Uh, and for the protection um, of female bodies in general. But I would say that, you know, in as much as they could be used to control parts uh, of human bodies uh, and to control their health, they could also have been used uh, to control women uh, for other purposes. Um, and I'll try to show you why, but this, you're gonna have to embark on this adventure with me because these are ideas that I'm actually uh, still working out. And again, I do not want to say that it is unlikely that they were used by women or for women. We know that they were. Um, the very famous physician Serranus in the second century talks about amulets. He says, you know, I don't recommend them for use, they don't work but please don't discourage women from using them because having hope can be a good thing. So that tells us that there were amulets that were used to you know, help women and that people believed in them even if the doctors didn't necessarily believe in them. And we definitely have earlier amulets that are very clearly tied to the uterus. This one's also from Harvard. It's made out of hematite, bloodstone. So this one's probably a better material for what it's intended, so it's red. And it has an actual uterus. So there's a uterus here. Uh, and is accompanied by um, several Egyptian deities. This was made in Egypt, uh, especially this one here I wanna note. Hopefully you can tell that it's a snake with hair. So that's the Egyptian god, Anubis, who is a snake with the head of a lion. Uh, so this was very much definitely about the uterus. It has an Ouroboros, so that snake that's eating its tail surrounding all the images. And then it has an inscription. In this case, the inscription is just a magical phrase, almost like abracadabra. It's called the soror logos. So it's a soror logos and it just continues. Now, the only two times that we know for sure what the soror logos uh, has been used to, used for is for opening. In one case to help a man escape, I think a prison. So for, you know, doors to be open for him. In another case, uh, for a woman to open up herself to the possibility of being loved by a man. Um, so in a sense, to open up her um, body for sexual intercourse. So uh, here we have this formula that is being used in this amulet supposedly for the uterus. We know for sure that it has been used in an erotic uh, magic against women. Um, now, the, uh, very quickly, I will get to a few other examples before I finish. So there is this association, I think, with the same kind of formula, the same kind of imagery, definitely in spells that are meant to uh, bind women romantically to men that they might not be interested in. The other thing is that the same formula, the same imagery is used to combat the evil eye, which is the danger that envy poses uh, on all of us. Um, and here we have an amulet very similar to ours, on one side, it has the writer motif, which we already know. And on the other one, it has an evil eye motif. And it's not very clear in the amulet. So I'm gonna show you kind of what that is from a more famous mosaic from Antioch. Um, so basically what you have is the eye here and it's being attacked on many sides by many different things. So by swords, by a scorpion, 
centipede, a dog, a cat, ibis, a snake, a trident, um, and even by the phallus of this uh, small man here. Uh, so really just throwing everything at it at once. Uh, again, here you have it in the amulet and associate it uh, with this um, holy saint that is uh, a spear, you know, uh, killing a demon that is perhaps also associated with envy. Um, so again, I, I don't necessarily think that these amulets are used for just, you know, problems with pregnancy or with menstruation, but more generally for other things. Uh, and if they are used uh, for women, they might be used uh, for many other things. And this is the image that I want to finish with. And it's a little bit of a disturbing image, but I am a terracotta person and I did want to finish with a terracotta figurine. Um, so this is a very kind of disturbing terracotta figurine that's in the Louvre. Uh, it shows a woman on her knees uh, with her hands behind her back and pierced by 13 nails. And we have instructions on how to use this figurine from one um, from the Greek magical papyri, uh, which is where we get a lot of these uh, formula, magical formula from. Um, and we're instructed that the clay image of a kneeling woman is to be accompanied by a statuette of Ares standing over her and plunging a sword into her neck. Uh, and that each body part of the female is to be inscribed with a magical phrase and pierced with one of 13 copper needles while saying, I pierce her this part in order that she have no one in mind but me. So this is all a ritual to get a woman um, to desire a man um, sexually. Uh, it's very generally violent, even if the desired effect is meant to be uh, psychological. And I'm not sure <laughs> that I necessarily want to make a direct connection between this and the amulet. But what I do want to say is that, you know, maybe those amulets were used to control not just parts of the women, but women in more ways, in ways that are not necessarily helpful. Or then in general, we have to see these objects as not just having one singular function, but having multiple functions, depending on who was using them, when and for what purpose. And for sure, the things that we excavate and study have full multi-dimensional lives and being in contact with them can foster, I hope, an increased sense of empathy uh, with people who are outside of our own space and time, and hopefully more importantly, with people who are uh, closer to us uh, right now. So thank you very much. Um, Oh, sorry about that. I was on mute. Francis, thank you so much. Oh, my dog is actually barking in the background. I apologize. But um, this was a great journey and we appreciate the beginning in Sardis and what led us to the amulet. And I realized my earrings today are sort of a similar shape, which was not intentional, but I would love to begin the Q&A portion of our program. So I invite all of our viewers to send questions to the Q&A box and we will get through as many as possible. So I would love to start with this one. Um, early on, Francis, you had mentioned that um, the objects in Sardis are not able to be removed from Turkey. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, the practice of archaeology, thankfully, has changed a lot uh, since, you know, we started doing Western archaeology in the 18th and 19th century. Back then, people used to take objects home and divide it against, you know, amongst each other. So that's why you have museums like the British Museum and the Louvre that have these amazing uh, collections. Uh, but that has changed, and now countries are protecting their own patrimony. So, and we do it happily. Things that we excavate stay in Turkey. Uh, they either stay at our compound if they're, you know, we excavate a lot of literal trash. Right, not everything goes to a museum, but we keep it in our house for study, but within Turkey, um, in very secure spaces, cleaned and very well taken care of. And everything that's actually nice, like this amulet, will go to the local museum. So the amulet is right now in our closest museum, which is in Manisa. Uh, hopefully, it will be displayed one day. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, sort of along these lines, too, can you tell us a little bit more about? the assignment process. We know that you've been working there since 2003. So how is it that you might be assigned to work on a particular dig over another? A little bit more information on that, I think. Yeah, so appreciate. I 
I didn't go to school at Harvard. I went to school at Cornell. Uh, but this dig is an enterprise joined by both Harvard and Cornell. And you know, I wanted to be an archaeologist. So my advisor, Andrew Ramage, who is fabulous and who works at the dig since forever, uh, recommended that I join the dig. And uh, once you're there, it's really all hands on deck. So it really depends on what's most necessary uh, you know, to do. So my first year there, I was their site registrar. So I was the person who was putting numbers on objects and describing them and drawing them and whatnot. This past season, we were a very small group because of the pandemic. And we all had to do everything. We had to you know, cook, clean, dig, you know, clean objects, help in the depot. So it really depends uh, on what the excavation needs at a certain moment. That's how you end up doing different jobs. Excellent, thank you. Um, in one of your final slides, you showed us that image of the, the terracotta. Um, can you tell us a little bit more? I had mentioned earlier um, when I was introducing you that you are curating an exhibition about small terracotta and bronze objects. Um, at Harvard Art Museums. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, no, this is very exciting. Hopefully it will still happen in 2023. Um, we are bringing, we will be bringing hopefully part of the collection of James Loeb. James Loeb was a very important person to classicists. Most classicists know them because of the James Loeb collection, which is the set of green and um, red books that have all the classical works uh, translated from Greek and Latin into English. Uh, so he did that, but also he had a collection of objects like most men of his age. But unlike most men of his age, he collected tiny things. Most men like big, flashy things uh, or coins. Uh, but he was very interested in terracotta figurines for some reason. He has a bunch of them. And we hope to bring them to Harvard and to show how fascinating they can be because, uh, you know, most museums tend to show the big marbles, uh, mm -hmm. the fancy painted vases, sure. but these objects tend to be smaller, uglier, not necessarily flashy. So uh, they're harder to see, but the stories behind them tend to be a lot more fun. And they do tend to show us things about the lives of ordinary people like us, sure. uh, rather than the emperor or whatnot. Great, thank you. Um, one of our viewers asked this question, was the topsoil which covers the Sardis site intentionally placed there? And if so, for what purpose? Okay, yeah. Well, I mean, intentional is a bit, it's a bit of a complicated question. A lot of it just comes down from the mountain. So just natural erosion, things will just start slowly getting covered uh, throughout time. So if you go to say like Rome, uh, or Istanbul, you'll notice that there's differences in level from antiquity to now, even in places that are continuously habitated. In the case of Sardis, additionally, the area was turned into farmland. So there is soil that is added and moved around in order to plant, um, you know, olive trees or grapes or whatever. Uh, so that's how things get covered, amongst other things. Thank you. Um, another question from one of our viewers, can you, can you speak to us about the ideas on the connection between, and you'll have to excuse my pronunciation here, the Anubis and the serpent amulet iconography, travel, cultural exchange, et cetera? Ooh, okay, so yeah, <laughs> it's, just, it's really complicated. So I think the tradition of these amulets is just very, very old and is very, very broadly spread. So depending on where you are, you're gonna use you know, if you're in a Christian setting during the Byzantine period, you're going to use a holy writer and a demon. But if you're in Roman Egypt, you're probably going to use some, um, you know, Egyptian deities or whatever. So you use the symbols that have meaning to you. When things work, if it ain't broke, you don't fix it, especially with magic. So if something works, you're going to keep using it, even if it loses meaning. So if that snake with the hair worked, you're gonna keep repeating it, even if you're disconnected um, from its original meaning. So I think that's uh, how you get um, those repetition of symbols. Also, in a place like Sardis, the lion is very important. So a symbol that has a crest with rays and looks like a lion is probably gonna be adopted uh, more easily. So that's just a very simple answer to a very complicated question. Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, and we have time for one final question here. 
Um, can you outline how the inscription traveled from this amulet to be on American soldiers' bandanas? Is there any known direct connection? Yeah, no, so the Psalm is just from the book of Psalms. So that's just from the Bible. Uh, so, you know, the things that ended up in amulets were either being taken from books of charms, from books of magic, or from the Bible. Again, depending on what you're using, you know, it's, it's not magical if you believe in it. That's what I wanted to say that maybe I shouldn't have used the word magic. Uh, but yeah, it ends up here with the Bible, but it has, it keeps that protective uh, aspect to it. Uh, so it's still considered to be the protected psalm, which I find very mm -hmm. interesting um, that soldiers awesome. would wear. Thank you so much. Well, we have just run out of time, Francis. Thank you so very much for your time. Um, as soon as you close out of this webinar, a brief survey will appear. So we hope you'll take a moment to complete that. And as a reminder, this lecture was recorded and we will be sharing it with all of our viewers today. Um, you will shortly see on your screen that Francis is scheduled to lead a trip for the Harvard Travel Program next year, Legendary Turkey from October 11th through the 25th, 2022. If you'd like to check out more information on the trip, I encourage you to click the link that you will find in the chat. Um, and finally, we hope to see you in the new year for our travel talk titled Civil Rights in America, presented by John Stauffer. Um, this promises to be a really interesting conversation, so we hope to see you there. And you can also find the registration link in the chat. Thank you again, and happy holidays on behalf of the Harvard Travel Team. Thank you again, Francis.